Hi, it's Luke here from Rackage Machinery. Today I'll be talking about hydraulic horsepower on large mining excavators. For your more complex machine performance faults, uh, the energy or the hydraulic energy might need to be considered to help you troubleshoot. The hydraulics in excavators are designed to draw the maximum amount of power from the engines during a dig cycle. So a customer or a machine owner expects a certain amount of productivity by the machine per hour. Any leakage, losses, reduced pressure, restriction, um, reduced engine performance will directly affect the productivity of the machine. So some of your more complex issues might require some attention to this principle. I've got an example of that that I'll show you in a few extra slides. Um, so the formula for hydraulic energy, uh, I called it horsepower at the start, but we'll be using the SI or metric units, kilowatts. It's pressure in bar times flow in litres per minute divided by 600. But as a, an older fellow, a real intelligent bloke I used to work with a long time ago, put it to me, uh, hydraulic horsepower is essentially pressure times flow. That was Bruce Stansby. Um, he was a physics master's degree holder at Curtin University in Western Australia and a fitter. Um, just like to fix diggers in it for fun. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here and the thing that surprised me the most is with this table here of your flow across the top and your pressure on the side column there. If you look at 300 bar at 500 litres a minute, it's only 250 kilowatt. But at 50 bar at 6,000 litres a minute, it's twice the amount of energy consumed. So flow actually is a huge a huge impact to engine load and horsepower basically. So maximum pressure at low flow is low engine load, low pressure max flow is still, it's still a low load, but obviously it works being pressure times flow diagonally across this table as it gets up towards this top corner. It's, it's the most down to the, to the least in this bottom left hand corner. So a simple analogy of come up with and it's probably just a way I wished it was explained to me in my younger days. Um, imagine you're sitting on a push bike, your front wheel's chopped, you're not going anywhere, you've got all your weight on that front foot and you're not pedaling, so it's a low energy requirement while you're doing that. So if pressure is body weight and your flow is RPM for your pedaling, it's a low energy requirement there. But when you speed that up, if you're in a low gear and you're only using 20% body weight on each pedal but you're pedaling it, uh, one hertz, um, 60 RPM, it's a it's a much higher energy requirement. So a trick I learned off an, another older fella that I worked with many years ago, Alistair Mullen, he showed me this. It's um this has been absolutely instrumental with uh, troubleshooting relief valves and other uh, hydraulic bypassing issues. Is using your engine load on the Murphy gauges for your Cummins engines in the Terex machines. Um, it, this value can also be found in your BCS and it's also in the camp machines as well. So what I've drawn here is a, a basic um, attachment schematic. So your main pump there is sending oil your, through your MCB here. Your spool is shuttled over and you're extending your cylinders and you're stalled. Um, when it's like this, your pump should be destroked and should be just making a nominal flow and the engine load typically would be, if there's no leakage, 20 to 30%. But what we've drawn here is the secondary relief valve. We've just sort of indicated some, some bypassing through that secondary relief valve, some leakage. So your pump actually will be upstroked. So it'll be producing some flow to maintain that 320 bar at stall. And that, the you know proportional to the amount of leakage is a can be a huge impact on your engine load so that um your percentage will come right up there uh, this is the 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 table I, I typically or these are the numbers i normally run by for my assessment on on the the, the performance of relief valves so 30 40 percent could be leakage and if you can hear it in the control valve then you know it is otherwise it could be something like low boost or just an engine that's slightly down in performance could could give you that as well so i don't normally launch it throwing uh, relief valves at it when it's like that. 40 to 100% is, um yeah, they're, they're, they're basically catastrophically failed relief valves and you can, um yeah, you can generally hear that through your return valves. So if I go back to my push bike analogy, um, in that state, you're, you're basically putting all your body weight on, on, on the pedals to turn it, but 
you're still driving forward. So imagine just going up a really, really steep hill in the highest gear, and that's that's basically what you're seeing there for the for the load on your engine for a bypassing relief. A possible downstream effect you might experience with a machine that is consistently failing relief valves and in some cases if those relief valves remain in that machine is the higher engine load will absolutely cause a an increase in uh, your fuel burn so an engine has a life cycle based on the amount of fuel burn uh, manufacturers will will figure out what an average fuel burn is and then they will equate that to a, a, a SMU life so 15,000 hours for argument's sake but if that engine's uh, burning more fuel, it will basically mean the life cycle of that engine would almost certainly become shorter and shorter. You might get lucky and might see that 15,000 hours, but um, it wouldn't shock me at all to know that you were seeing some faults that were very difficult to pinpoint back to bypassing hydraulics in your engine. Um, it's not something I've dug down that deep into, um, but I do intend to. Uh, it's for long-term reliability it, it certainly could be a factor uh, it also applies to your pumps and your pump drive as well you increase that the duty on those components because the the extra load placed upon them trying to supplement that that leakage in the hydraulics you're basically making your engines and pumps work harder than they need to so you might see a problem towards end of life of those components potentially so the first example i gave was how you can read the engine load parameters to indicate some excess hydraulic leakage in your system this is a an example of a, a really obscure fault that i encountered a few years ago um, where the same principle really helped me solve this problem um, we had a, an rh340b that was intermittently bogging the engines down and they would actually shut down occasionally sometimes it was one engine sometimes it was both for a week it might have been the left en engine and might have been a couple times a shift and sometimes it might not have happened for a week or so it was um yeah pretty pretty tricky to catch but you know with production screaming for the machine you'd go down there and we'd test it couldn't really fault it it would it would work then and there and then we'd send it back to work so this this went on and on for a while but um it was when i was bouncing ideas off bruce stansby there one day and uh talking about how the engine load wasn't wasn't meeting the requirements for the hydraulics, and it was when that was when I learned from Bruce Stansby that the that hydraulic horsepower is essentially pressure times flow. So it might not be a matter of the pressure; it might be a combination of the two. Um, and he was dead right. So when we were testing it, the only way you could closely simulate it was to extend your bucket and stick out, as shown here, with your teeth in the dirt, all the weight down, floated down, so there's no weight on your um your boom cylinders. You'd pull your boom up and then go full slew. And as your machine is loading up them engines, once the bucket reached about cab height, that's when we were uh, starting to see your um, your high, uh, so you'd hit hold and you'd catch your engine RPM low like that. And also your XLR, which is uh, responding to your engine RPM, that's dropped right off. Um, your slew pressure was, was sitting high, so that's, still fully loaded up and yeah yeah so that was we we could actually catch the, the engines working really hard there so um we couldn't fault the engines at all we'd done a lot of inspections and and testing on in that space and there was nothing but one of the things that grabbed us was the 12 second cycle time on the slew so a dual engine cycle time was three seconds faster than spec and the only thing that can do that is an increase of hydraulic flow so as you can see here we were we were getting the close to the right amount of pressure but we were actually it was actually producing more flow so and it was actually happening on both engines as well which made it even more confusing so we couldn't actually pinpoint it to one one particular component so the 340 and the 6060 swim pumps are a 250cc pump limited to 180cc by these two Q max screws so showing it actuating there to those stops. So that's 180 cc to swash on your displacement. So we dug a little deeper on the swing 
cycle time fault and did individual pump cycle times and found that they were all coming back fast. Um, so we went and removed the, uh, the servo piston caps off and saw where the Q-Max screw had basically been impacting that servo piston and it had left a mark there which was like five to seven mil deep from memory. Um, so essentially that screw was wound out five to seven millimeters basically top and bottom on all four pumps we we actually never physically inspected the bottom side because it's got the the center pin bolt for the servo piston and it's uh, not wise to pull that out in the field um, but we could we could prove it with cycle time so we basically took that measurement there to fix it we actually wound those q max screws in on top and bottom on all four slew pumps and basically tweak them until we got the 30 second cycle time we were looking for on single engine operation. Um, and that that solved the fault temporarily, but immediately. So that fault was solved simply by making, we, we could see the fault before we made that adjustment and then that fault had basically gone away, which a, fault, a persistent fault that had been there for, for months and months. Um, uh, following that, we spoke to Hycon Hydraulic Systems in Perth and they were familiar with this issue and they'd already had a solution where they they limit the uh, the displacement on these pumps uh, where there's some concentric spacer ring somewhere incorporated in that pump I don't exactly know where but it limits that flow and it, and it gives it a more um, a greater surface area for that servo piston to stop upon um, and yeah never saw that fault return after that um, I've never personally encountered that before or after then but it was it was Kind of strange how we saw that on all four pumps, top and bottom. And, you know, as, as far as we could go, that, that was the root cause we could see. I mean, whether there's some other underlying root cause to leading to that, or as far as I could tell, as far as I was concerned, it was just the that um, location of the Q-Max screws just in that un, uneven surface contact area on the, on the outer ring of the servo piston. So, in short, basically the increased flow caused excess horsepower draw on the engine. So here's a spreadsheet I put together for calculating the slew cycle time and the energy required to do it with the hydraulics. On the right here is all the parameters that contribute to your cycle time and here's all your calculations on the on the left. So we were getting a 12 second cycle time, here's your t twin engine cycle time, so 14.8 is spec, when that, that's when everything's right, so at 0.18 litres per rev which is 180cc you get your 15 second cycle time, we were getting 12 on this particular machine with the fault. Um, when the pumps have the Q-Max screws removed completely, they're 250cc, which would have given us about a 10.7 second cycle time. Um, we were getting 12 seconds, so that, yeah, so the, the Q-Max screws had worn in to the servo piston and given the pumps about a 220cc displacement to get us that so at that displacement it was 255 kilowatts so I'll just drop that over here um, yeah. drop that there and then I'll return that back to 0.18 so the standard so 208.9 kilowatts so that's per pump that, and I'll put the formula in the on the slide here as well so you can drop it into a calculator and figure this out yourself so that times four for all four slew pumps and that equates to a 185 kilowatt of extra load on the engine so when your main pumps are fully bottomed out so your XLRs drop right off um, there's normally enough engine power to to accommodate your slew there, but with that 185 extra kilowatt load on the on the engines, um, that was enough to pull them right down and snuff them out. So to recap on all that, uh, the main message I'm trying to communicate here is the hydraulic energy principle of pressure times flow, and that's not to be used as the mathematical formula, but just as a mindset to understand that pressure or engine load increases with pressure and flow combined. Um, the formula is here in kilowatts uh, bar times litres per minute divided by 600. 
um, the formula to put into a spreadsheet is here. Uh, you just copy those cells. I'll put the PDF of this presentation or a link to this PDF in the description below. Um, one of the more surprising things that I found when researching this was that high flow and low pressure combined is a greater energy consumer than high pressure and low flow uh, in the context of your mining excavators. So like a 300 bar you see here, 300 bar with 500 litres a minute. So it's, there's a bit of flow there. Um, you're only 250 kilowatt. And so for an RH400, 300 bar is your stall. Assuming there's 500, 500 litres a minute leakage there at stall, um, I, I would hope not. Um, it's still only half the amount of energy at 50 bar at 6,000 litres a minute. So that's 500 kilowatts. So a credit to the guys that I'd learned some of these principles from, Bruce Stansby, uh, Alistair Mullen, and Ben Hondemar, which I've mentioned throughout the presentation. Um, those guys have helped me uh, considerably with some of the, the learnings I've taken to, to, reach, to reach a point where I can produce this material that I can share. Um, if, if there is any problem with what you see here, if I've got something wrong, by all means, let us know in the in the comments. I'm, ha I'm happy to hear it. I'm still trying to figure it all out myself. Any questions, uh, drop that in the comments as well. And as mentioned in the previous video, if there is any specific topics you want to cover or you, you would like me to cover around the Terex uh, diggers, uh, if I know enough about it, I might be able to produce a, um, a video for you. So by all means, yeah, throw it out there and I'll see what I can do for you. Thank you.